From founding tech-centric startups, deploying strategic investments, leveraging social media, or building a digital brand, today's modern athlete, whether active or retired, is continuously redefining what it means to be a professional on and off the playing surface. And on this show, I talk to the biggest power brokers in sports. I'm Paul Rabel, and this is Suiting Up Podcast. Today's show is different. I'm going to sit down with my co-creator. He's also the founder of Shootout for Soldiers and now manager of the Lacrosse Network, or TLN, a subsidiary of media powerhouse Whistle Sports. His name is Tyler Steinhardt. A major reason why we started this podcast is I love that the medium is so agile. You can product test, you can be authentic and transparent, and you can do different things, like today's show. And I'll be honest, on the outset, I wasn't sure if I was going to be a one-and-done podcast or a seasonal show or run short on, frankly, podcast guests. Last week, we published our 10th episode, and we're really pleased with the product and feedback. There are a lot of challenges, many of which we'll discuss on today's show, and in this episode, Tyler and I wanted to invite you into our conference room for a behind-the-scenes conversation on when, why, and how we started the pod. We're going to talk about what we've learned and who we're planning to position the show around moving forward. So with that, enjoy our 11th episode, talking about the fruition of the podcast, the first 10 shows, and hopefully the next 10. What is in my current Audible queue, you ask? Well, I just finished Tribes for the third time by Seth Godin. I'm attempting to finish and polish off my foreign policy off the back of my political science pedigree from Johns Hopkins and listening to Understanding Power, the indispensable Chomsky. That's right, by Noam Chomsky. And finally, a multiple time recommendation from my peers, The Rise of Superman, decoding the science of ultimate human performance by Stephen Kotler. Audible content includes an unmatched selection of audio books, original audio shows, news, comedy, and more from the leading audiobook publishers, broadcasters, entertainers, magazine and newspaper publishers, and business information providers. Audible is offering our listeners a free audiobook with a 30-day trial membership. I recommend you do this. Just go to audible.com forward slash Rabel and browse the unmatched selection of audio programs, download a title free and start listening. It's that easy. And I love it. Go to audible.com forward slash Rabel. That's audible.com forward slash Rabel, and get started today. Friends of the podcast, I've been rocking facial hair, well, growing, trimming, and shaving it now for 15 years. That's pretty much half my life, and I suppose it's the Lebanese blood. Shout out Papa Rabel if you're listening. And now the biggest thing to happen to Barbasol since shaving cream is also the only thing to happen to Barbasol since shaving cream. Introducing new Barbasol razors, the brand America trusts for a close, Comfortable Shave now has premium disposable razors. Barbasol's close shave technology on every razor means you get an advanced pivoting head and ultra-thin open flow blades. The Ultra 6 Plus razor also features a seventh blade, and it's specifically designed to refine and style tricky areas like under the nose, sideburns, and beard, like mine. Visit Barbasol.com and get a $2 savings coupon and see for yourself why Barbasol razors are the number one new disposable razor out there. You're looking good, America. You are shaving with Barbasol. So Tyler, what are the apps on your home screen? All right, so uh, I did not prime this, uh, but- Is this your, this is your question. Okay. Yeah, this is this, this is, is my favorite question. This is a value prop. So I saw to the podcast. I saw that you actually look at your phone two hundred times a day, according to Bloomberg. So two hundred times you see these these home screen apps. Yeah. So my bottom four are a phone and texts, then Google Keep, which is sort of like um, Evernote, and then Google Calendar, and other ones I'd say stand out. Headspace, so you only have three on the bottom. Four. Text. The last one. Text okay. phone. Google Keep. Google Calendar. Um, Pretty normal ones on the front page, by the different ones being Headspace, Audible, Podcast Op, obviously, um, and then Way of Life, which is like basically a daily tracker of things you do. And so I track like, did I eat meat today? Did I meditate? Did I do yoga? Pull that up to see like long term trends. Um, it's a little less engaged now than I used to be. 
Um, oh, it's offline right now. But like, I'll have like hoops, cardio. So this is just resets right now. So this is blank. But it'll mm. just check these things and it'll show like they did Duolingo or they do an app, something like that. Um, so kind of like a fun test to see like personal goals that I'm doing to see if I'm reaching that. Is that for like weekly or monthly reflection, quarterly reflection? Really, I, monthly, I would imagine I would it say. spits yeah. out reports for you, right? Yeah. Really, what sucks is that it says like green uh, boxes if you hit it, and you have a red box if you don't. What I find is that when I hit a red box, I get so like annoyed that I broke my streak that I'll just quit some whole different habits. And so mm-hmm. it's really just trying to get to thirty is really my goal for each of these different habits. I think that's the ultimate challenge for a lot of these mindfulness apps. You mentioned Headspace being one of them, and then Way of Life and another is that that they they want you to work on being present, being thoughtful, and doing, you know, hitting certain achievements. But because of the gamification, which is a core uh, component of a successful app via mobile, and and even these uh, meditation apps have gamification, is that I find myself on a on a bit of a streak right now through headspace and meditating so i keep the streak going exactly yeah which is not the purpose of yeah of meditating yeah. <laughs> yeah that's why i do the the sleep meditation I'm on 49 one. days is like can't it's like, screw it up yeah now. is now i do like i'm like oh i didn't get my meditation in today i need to sleep meditate through the headspace just to keep that going um <laughs> one that has a really good one is um audible audible yeah. has badges sort of like, yeah, um, like that. xbox rewards where it's like daily things like that but it's also like you listen to 10 hours of total time yeah. or you're in a hot streak of listening and this is the longest time you've done it which i think is fast it's like gamification does make me use their app more for sure yeah um so i don't know it's pretty fun to kind of do that for headspace yeah so i have tyler steinhardt here the co-creator of suiting up podcast and the purpose of this episode right here is not necessarily to find a, a filler episode for lack of a guest on a Monday, <laughs> but I think uh, explore different ways that we can take our show and bring authenticity to surface on why we created it. Because it's really, I think it's, it's really fun for both of us to do this Agreed. form of content. And the way that we got together and created this show, I believe, is not only unique, but worth talking about. Uh, and then the, the last area is to actively solicit your feedback on how you think the show's gone so far with our, with our guests, each of our guests. And, and not all of them are, are athletes. And of the athletes, some are retired and some are active. So I think we're, we're finding out... Um, more of uh, more not only about what makes our show good in certain ways and maybe not so good in others, but ways that we may want to broaden out some of our guests into the broader sports business space. So before I jump ahead too far, why don't you give our listeners a little background on yourself, starting with your age? Yeah, I'm 23. Yeah. Um, so I, I know Paul through Shootout for Soldiers, I think originally, uh, which is a lacrosse charity I run that Paul had come in and played um, and played before as well and attended for years and then linked up the first up, one in Baltimore um, yeah the OG one um, I think the second year too you and Hartzell played as well yeah. and a few other guys played which is pretty fun um, and you started that organization when you were how old 18 yeah. um, so it was pretty young going about it and sort of been in lacrosse space since then worked in Uganda lacrosse a few other things as well I think that we've kind of touched base on in the past and then this came about I think I was returning home actually from last year in Shoot Out for Soldiers in August and emailed you and said, look, I listened to a lot of podcasts. You know, I was always driving. So the event that I run is across the country. And so we would drive this RV to all these places. And to pass the time of a 12-hour drive from St. Louis to Denver, we listened to podcasts. Yeah. And so I became a fiend of podcasts. And so this really kind of originated the connection between it. Yeah. And other forms of, of content, and, and it's like an, there's an ecosystem of, of ways that we can consume content now. So this is through uh, you know the the audio form, and previously to this, what what had what had kind of inhibited me from getting into this arena was was video and me going long in video. Um, you know, I've blogged occasionally, but now we're writing more. We'll get into that. Um, and then the couple of companies that we operate, uh, it was just it was really it was really challenging for me to to figure out if a there was a uh, if there was a theme that got me energized to to enter into podcasting, and then b 
uh, did I have the bandwidth to, to really pull this off? And we're still trying to figure that out now. But you're like a pretty good podcast listener yourself, though. You turned me on to Dan Savage and a few other folks that I had no idea of that now I'm a hardcore yeah. listener of that I can't get enough of. Yeah. Well, I love podcasts. And I have some experience, I should say, in audio now for three years, actually. So probably more than some. I have three years of experience hosting a weekly show called The Lacrosse Show with Paul Carcatero on Sirius XM, where I'm basically a color analyst for the feed, meaning Paul talks about what's going on in our sport. Mm -hmm. It's an hour-long show. Uh, recaps games, gives statistics, gives his, his uh, really acute eye for the game, being an ESPN broadcaster, uh, color commentator. He's, does, he's done some play-by-play. And then I just chime in from the player's perspective. That's gone really well, but it, it, it feels so natural to talk about the sport. Uh, and I had been approached prior to us linking up and talking about podcasts from several companies asking, hey, Paul, do you have interest in doing a lacrosse-specific pod? I put out so much content regularly, <laughs> and most of, probably all of it, aside from this show, is lacrosse-based. I was really interested in... in and if there was a world where I could host a show not having to do with lacrosse. And I think your proposition was really interesting to me because you were like, hey, you know, I, I don't see you talking about lacrosse either. I see you talking about sports and business more broadly. And that's your interest too. I mean that's yeah. like people think because you do that for a living, that's your sole interest. But the reality is is that what you're consuming on a day-to-day basis is not – where these kids are coming into college, but you know the latest VC deal, the latest tech acquisitions, and so yeah. much more. And so, if you can talk about something from an authentic state of view and point, like it gets you more energized to talk about it for an hour long, and then do these kind of regularly. Whereas the crossing you're in, you know, every day, you yeah, know, it's very different. What interests me about Tyler when I met him half a dozen years ago, probably, yeah, when you were running this event, and I made an appearance at your shootout event in, in Baltimore. It went really well. So not only were you operating a, a really meaningful property in our sport, the concept was unique, so there was some ingenuity to it. I thought you, um, you, know, you were curious, you were smart, and you hustled way beyond your years. Um, so I remember going to coffee with you a bunch, talking about sh- shootout for soldiers. You've done a lot of coffee meetings. Yeah, coffee meetings. Probably like two a year, it seems like. And I think that's what, that, that's what really uh, built or sculpted our relationship was we would meet on one topic, whether it's one of your shootout events in Boston or some strategic partnership you wanted to put in place, whether it's a brand from a sponsorship level or something else. And our coffee meeting would turn to like two and a half hours. Yeah, which is like... dent my calendar. Yeah. (laughs) But that was like, for years, it was just sort of like, honestly, me picking your brain on some things, you know? And like, it's from a perspective of like, you've been in this space a long time. When I was growing shootout, it was an opportunity for me to learn from someone who understands that where not a lot of folks are willing to talk about that kind of stuff. And you're very open about that. Yeah. And so for years, we would just kind of ramble for a couple hours at a time. And um, since this kind of started, it's felt like we're talking you know, almost every day at this point you yeah. know, on this podcast around ideas or potential guests or sort of linking to articles and folks who are doing great businesses who are athletes themselves. And so yeah. I find that so fascinating how it's kind of changed the relationship over the year, especially. Yeah, and I think originally we spoke a lot about events and properties in the sport and operating because that's yeah. what you were in. And then there came a point in time about a year ago where you started to – uh, via whether it was was it a headhunter or or how did uh, Whistle Sports first hear about you? I don't know. I mean, I got linked up in like last June, and then you know, ended Samir up joining out. in like Samir in March. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, one of our friends reached out about Whistle Sports, who was looking for basically a, a president of content strategy. Effectively, I'm not sure yeah. what your actual title is now, but there was a time where Whistle Sports was we I, we talked about it on the Jeremy Lin podcast, who's an investor. Um, or has an equity position, not an investor in the company. I'm an investor, but we're both channel partners, and they're now a a broad digital advertising network, but originally an MCN, so focused specifically on like YouTube and Facebook, and um, through partnerships and channel partners created basically modern media and figured out ways to monetize off of that. The lacrosse network was acquired by Whistle Sports. Now you're running TLN Ops, but it took you – about a year and some change to decide, okay, I'm, I'll, I'll take this risk and move to New York. 
and basically become, uh, you know, a content man. Yeah, I mean, this was a quick upturn because for a while it was – I was just doing shoot off for soldiers and had this podcast kind of as like the side hustle. It gave me energy and then it was like my first foray into content a little bit and I took that job at Whistle Sports. It was all of a sudden I was doing content every day and doing shoot out and then the podcast all of a sudden was like something audio that was so new to me as well and that I was able to compare that and how video is produced, which is – you know, 10 people, oftentimes, you know, lighting and coloring and so much more. And, and at post-production and audio is very agile. It's very slim. Like, yeah. you're able to just set up these two mics like this and record. And so, right. for me, I have a lot of energy around that, too, because I think that it's a very authentic conversation and that there's not eight, you know, cameras all around us, you know, kind of filming that. And so, I've had the opportunity to learn. I'm very new to the content game, but we researched the two of us audio from... I'd say August to March relentlessly. You know, right. we, we pick through the podcasts that we like, the production styles we like, the people who are doing it right, the different companies that were out there. I mean, that was something that it seems easy that we just kind of were doing it now, but we spent a lot of time, even in this office, we demoed a podcast previously. So you look yeah. at that long tail of production, like, yeah, our first one came out in May, but we started working on this in August, like seriously about yeah. this. Yeah, and you have the original email you told me when we were walking into this conference room. Yeah, the original email discussed podcasting, an emoji app, um, which you did uh, yeah. with Rave Emoji. <laughs> um, uh, shootout for Soldiers, um, Rave Coast, what you're building here, especially events as well, yeah. and then um, a video game. There was so, that much yeah. in the one email. And I think that was like we talked at like a yeah. coffee shop, talked Got for it. hours on it. Um, and yeah. the, the game too was – we ended up having a whole different branch on the game as well, whether we should do a, a you know, highly produced Xbox PlayStation game, yeah. which you ballparked at $10 million or a million users kind of play. Which is what EA Sports typically designates right. for a new you know, property. We're doing a, like a video game on your phone, looking at Do Perfect, the right. success they've had recently. Right. And that was like, for me, a lot of energy around that too, is that gaming is something that was so fascinating. I still think you should get into e-gaming and e-sports you yeah. know, eventually, but um, podcasting is a route that we kind of took. That Those are two areas of interest. Uh, gaming, as you mentioned, and then television. Uh, but right now, we are very low on available bandwidth and really energized in video and audio, is what we're talking about. And, and, and you left that meeting, I, I, I remember telling you to put together a deck. Yeah, it's like a little like PowerPoint like in early September. So it's on why like, podcasting. And yeah. you pulled a bunch of metrics on yeah. listenership, year-over-year year growth over the past five years to demographic, uh, to popular shows, and that helped us sculpt 100%. this we, we sports picked, business show. I think we had both had a little niche and a feel for what worked well, like looking at Tim Ferriss or Dan Savage, all this yeah. stuff. But looking at the actual data, like there's more podcast listeners than Twitter users in the United States. Like that stuff that I think I remember just shocking me, the, the scope of it. Right. You know, the rise of, I mean, you put it best. We talk about Bluetooth audio in cars and, you yeah. know, and having headphones. Like yeah. you can download that kind of stuff now. That was a game changer for the whole space. Yeah. I remember looking specifically being in the video content space with the Paul Rabel experience, which is basically our OTT instructional platform where we create uh, lacrosse uh, skill videos for young kids to access behind a paywall. Um, I, I remember seeing the yoga um, OTT platforms, the other fitness platforms. And I've tried them before where you set up your laptop, you know, in the corner of your house and you're trying to mimic your yoga instructor. Right. And it's just really hard because you can't hold a pose without turning. And right. So then I heard about uh, another fitness app called uh, SkyFit. And I thought it was brilliant in that it was only audio. So it was that you would select your piece of equipment and say you wanted to work out at a gym and you had a, a certain uh, elliptical in front of you, you would locate that and then you would have a list of instructors and time. It's kind of like Peloton in a way, except for, for any piece of equipment. Then you would click on the time you had and you would automatically get an instructor in ear. And I realized like, that's all you need. And then I found myself making a connection to that specifically in that headphones are always in my ear, whether I'm commuting, whether I'm working. Without a doubt. And I can consume... Um, educational content, entertainment, stuff that I believe is, is helping me grow personally, professionally, socially, and I can do that far easier than, than I can when I'm watching where I have to be, you know, my undivided attention has to be fixated on that. Yeah, I think piece. watching and reading too are, are full attention, you know, you reading need to is, kind of yeah. commit to that fully, whereas audio is passive consumption, and so I think why there's so much room for audio to grow even more is that as we fight for attention, 
I want to maximize my time at the grocery store. If I have headphones and listen to a podcast, I feel like I'm learning as I'm grocery shopping. Yeah. And so all of a sudden, you feel like you're getting your best bang for your buck by listening to the podcast in the car or the grocery store or doing laundry. You're taking advantage of all these minutes during your day where you couldn't really make use previously. It's sort of how email on your phone is now you're able to you know listen to an audio book or listen to a podcast. And then that's really where it's so successful is the podcast consumption that's passively done yeah. um, where it's like you're not just sitting there listening. You're doing something while you're also listening and it's the second screening of audio and in some ways you're second screening life by listening. Yeah. And I think there were just to be transparent, there were two areas that having this conversation with you and thinking through it more that, that I felt we could accomplish by pulling this show off when the first one was to uh, have a medium that would enable us to talk about what we do from a business perspective, specifically coming from the shoes of an athlete, where you hear and have heard for decades. Previously, you know, you, you, you see the 30 for 30 piece on athletes going broke. Mm -hmm. um, you, you often heard athletes investing in real estate or their buddy's t-shirt company uh, that, that kind of goes belly up. Some of them have won in the past. But over the past decade, between the proliferation of social media and just the startup experiment costs going down, more athletes that are associated even with their NBA owners who are tech giants or NFL owners like the Kraft Group that are involved in, in the venture capital space and, operation, and operating multiple sports properties, is that they're now getting exposure with these huge deals yeah. that they're getting – from their respective court, field, or pool. I mean, uh, what's happening right now underneath us as we're recording this podcast is this crazy NBA deals that are seeming to pop up every <laughs> yeah. 30 minutes now. These guys are making $30 million <laughs> a year on court. So they have now, athletes have reshifted their focus on where they're spending. And then some, like Venus, is, is actually operating. And she was our second guest on right. Suiting Up. She's operating, not so just investing. Too. So is Forset operating. Um, and, and I don't think that the common, you know, mainstream 800 word article that takes three or four quotes from the athlete, uh, does the justice we think is, is deservingly appropriated for the level of thought and ingenuity for the skill sets that cross over from court field pool into business. So to have a long form medium like this to yeah. sit down and dive into the, to that toolkit I thought was point one. And then point two is you talk about their business and the analytics, sorry, the, the business of podcasting analytics this is an opportunity that, that we wanted to go after and, and see like, hey, is this something that we can uh, use to create a bigger brand and presence, not only around Paul Rabel, but the sport of lacrosse and kind of elevate into mainstream media, but also potentially monetize, right? We're investing, we've invested a lot of time into this. So it was those two areas. There was the opportunity in business, but for me, the, the, our, and, and you, yeah. we talked about what is our goal is, is, to, is to tell a broader story in sports and business. And it's a value add for the player, too. I think that what you're talking about that article is, is that it's looking at this guy as a pro athlete and saying, uh, okay, like great for them. They're trying business as if it's like they're not also smart and savvy themselves. And right. I think that's what sparked it was, is, you know, our conversations, I realized I wasn't talking to someone who was just good at lacrosse. It was that you understood the space really well and that you're a much more savvy entrepreneur than I was. And all of a sudden, you know, my blinders were one. You think of someone as just one dimensional and you realize that these folks are able to use your skill set in, in sports to make themselves far more dynamic than, than previously thought. And so looking at that lens, you realize these athletes are the ones who are actually the most savvy entrepreneurs in a lot of ways who are investing in incredible companies who have a feel for what sort of technology will work out well. And that's really what sparked this. And also your intellectual curiosity in this space helps spark that podcast as well is that you can't do a podcast where you're the interviewer if you're not like personally interested in everything around you at all times. And that's really what separated what you we're doing here versus, you know, just kind of talking to anyone about some things is that you need to have a host who's like personally invested and interested in what's going on. So we had the deck, you created it, and we were like, okay, this is really interesting. <laughs> yeah. um, for most of my 20s, if I were to broadly uh, kind of coalesce all of my efforts in business and kind of off the field and what I was doing into, into kind of three steps, I would say that I wanted to meet as many people 
in sports and business, athletes and executives as I possibly could. That was one. Two, learn as much as I could from them. And then three, the kind of the business aspect is, is how could I leverage that to create not only wherewithal and, and property building, but service too and mentorship and my foundation. And you know, I, I felt like if I did those th- three things well, that I would position myself well for the long game as, as a professional and an entrepreneur. Um, what I didn't know at the time though, is I, as I build this big network of athletes through events, whether I was going to South by Southwest, Fortune. MIT, Sloan and Analytics Conference, sport, Fortune Conferences, um, Sport Innovation yeah, Lab, yeah, the NBA All-Star yeah. Game, the Super Bowl for several years in a row. You, you meet people. I leveraged my agency at Octagon. There was just no way to plug them into any of my current offerings, right? I wasn't going to tell Coach Belichick, who's a close friend of mine, yeah. hey, can I uh, bring my DSLR up and GoPros and, and, and shoot <laughs> yeah, you in yeah. your office and put it on my YouTube Dude, channel? It's just like a yeah. different <laughs> – it's exactly it's, – it's a, it's a completely different form of content. So as we're building this, this concept, we're like, you know, holy crap, we have these athletes that Paul has either email or is texting with and – if they're anything like Paul, which I felt they are, and many of them I've learned from in a number of different ways, let's see if they want to sit down and talk like you and I are doing. Yeah, half the battle was going through your email list or your LinkedIn to figure out who you knew in this space. Yeah. Like, that was the real challenge was is like we had this great idea, yeah. and we had no idea of how many people you knew in this space with athletes and folks in audio too. Would, was that – that was probably – you know, that, that, that was make or break. It was yeah. like a cool concept, but – can you actually sit down with these folks? Yeah. Uh, and it was also like realizing so many folks who were interested, who'd be great fit for this, that, you know, if you ask someone like, Hey, who'd be great for your podcast, you get two or three names out there. And then we started digging in or, you know, every day, I feel like we add someone new to the, to the list of people we're adding and we're realizing, Oh, we do know this person. Oh, we have a connection here that sometimes you ask a question, it's not quite there, but like something will spark that. And that happened with a number of people who are advisors of ours now, it happened with people who are guests of ours. It kind of came out of nowhere. Yeah. You so you're referring to this talent matrix that we share. It's a Google doc. Yeah. And it's probably got close to now a hundred targets. Yeah. And, and, and a lot of my friends and, and people that listen to this show that they, you know, they, they inquire on, on, how we book talent. Is this a thing that you, your agency does for you? Or do you have a, you know, kind of this talent acquisition partner? I'm like, no, we just email and text and reach out to them. It's, I mean, a personal, uh, personal bit of advice that I got uh, from one of my mentors in this space, um, Ezra Kuchars, who is that former president of CBS radio, was that you're always only one call away. That stuck with me. Um, and, and that like to get to someone, there's likely, especially in the sports business space, if you can create a finite bubble of those people, even as big as LeBron James or Derek Jeter, if you think critically enough, and again, 10 years of building a network throughout all these properties, one call away or one email away. Now, does that convert? No, not all the time. But I think we were pleasantly surprised. Like the way that I thought about it was, okay, outreach, will convert, so we'll get a response on 50% of them, and we'll probably get a hard no for 50% of that, and then probably a soft yes, and then we'll run into schedule conflict, and we'll be able to book 10% of our guests. So I was trying to work my way back from how many people I know to landing 10% of that 50%. And we've gotten like all yeses. It just yeah. comes down to scheduling. I think actually also you're missing a key element too. It's kind of like spreadsheet numbers is that for me at least, it, reaching out to folks sometimes isn't easy. A lot of folks are hesitant to reach out to people, don't want to like busy their schedules or whatever. You're fearless. I mean like you will tweet at someone on Twitter. You'll send them <laughs> an email. Like, you'll cold call. Like you have no issue, which I was, right. I was shocked about. Because I in my mind it's like – Oh, you have an agent. You have people working with you who can like kind of instruction for you. You don't be that person doing it, and, and you know you really don't care at all. Like you've sent out way more emails than I have in talent acquisition of saying like, 
hey, so-and-so, like, love what you do here, references that an article link, this is what we're doing, and ping them. And you know, I either to redo that talent matrix because you had done maybe 40 cold emails in the last two weeks where it was just like, holy crap, we got to keep track of what Paul is doing here because he's so far ahead of the game. And for me, I got to, like, build up almost, like, courage in some ways to interview, ask one or two people for a favor because I feel like I'm burdening them in a lot of ways. But in reality, it's not that big of a burden. I get emails all the time myself personally. Um, but it, And you really don't care about that. So, like, when you say that as 10 people, a lot of folks are hesitant to reach out to people like they feel like they're burning them in some way and you're not you're, you're willing to kind of risk that but well, what makes this show go i believe is the authenticity of the style of content right it's right fairly unedited i i mean I, outside of it's nothing's really edited nothing's at all. Edited. yeah i mean we haven't released one of our guests who were instructed just general, generally in the podcast space, you're not supposed to reveal your guests until you drop them. Yeah. We screwed up on that a couple of times. We, we gleaned that from other uh, yeah. podcasters because it's like a race to talent. But we have a star NFL quarterback. It's the only guest so far that we recorded over the phone. And it's just so much more challenging recording a podcast over the phone than it is sitting down like you are right now in 100%. person. Because what makes this podcast authentically great is in any conversation that you guys, wherever you are listening to have, is that interruptions aren't as kind of, they're, they're not as curt in person as they are over the phone. Because you can see someone's body language. Exactly. And, in like, and it's actually out of excitement and like, oh, Tyler, what you're saying yeah, right now is so speak, good. Yeah. I want to I jump in. Yeah. And, and it also helps edge away from the traditional journalist Q&A that most athletes have partaken in. So, again, going back to what you were saying, though, authenticity of this show, I found an outreach coming from me uh, is, is just like just speaks really organically to what we're trying to accomplish. I right? think it stems from Brene Brown too. I mean, you turned me on to her and, and I listened to Daring Greatly. I didn't read it actually. I listened to it via Audible. Yeah. And I loved that. And it, to, yeah. to me, that kind of spoke a lot of ways and that I found via if it, like Tim Ferriss's pod you sent me and then I ended up listening to her book. It was fantastic. Tim Ferriss, when he would guest lecture, I believe it was at the GSB, one of the schools out west, um, he would put together a prize package that would include a round trip airfare to anywhere yeah. in the world to one of their students if they could uh, blindly reach out and get in touch with one of three of the most popular people on the planet that he would write on, on the board to start the semester, which would either be probably Warren Buffett, President Obama at the time, and call it Michael Jordan. Yeah. Right? Like three people, you just be like, how the hell am I getting in touch with them? Yeah. But it's the, the, the exercise is like there's a way. So, yeah, I think you're right. The, the outreach is important. It's, it's a big part of the show, and I would say part one of success, we, we said, would be talent. 100%. Part two was a partner because we felt like finding a podcast company could help us cover our blind spots given that none of us have, neither of us had podcasted before. None, yeah. We experimented with it. We got our own little kit. Yeah, we tried it. Yeah, and we figured, and I think we, we we could have been all right, but because I had previous conversations with a number of groups um, about doing a lacrosse specific podcast, we had those contacts. We started com uh, having conversations, and I think from our several advisors on the in, on the audio side, they were just kind of like yeah, we did I some LinkedIn mining for who liked lacrosse as well. Like, that's I right. Distinctly, like like you like up folks who were involved in podcasts, and then. Crawford's in that with tweets about lacrosse and being like, yeah, oh, here's a kind of that, how we can kind of get a window in somewhere. Right, right. Uh, and we're still doing that. All the time. I mean, that's something I do almost every day that I, if people think that just because your network is huge, you're connected with someone via LinkedIn, that's it. But like, you can't just email someone cold and have like no intro a little bit. You'd have some background like, hey, I saw you're a big Ohio State lacrosse fan or I saw that you love X, Y, and Z. And that's a great way to kind of get a competition started that yep. we've done on a majority of our guests that, um, you know, it's kind of funny. Yeah. So structure a deal with digital media. We're mm -hmm. based in New York. There was actually some similarities when I looked at the big podcasting companies. Uh, digital reminded me a lot of Whistle when I was in with Whistle Sports on the, on the video side in that they had a, a hyper-targeted focus, uh, fewer, fewer shows in their stable than, say, um, 
a you name it full screen or full screen yeah yeah exactly but but it, it felt to us that they were putting a lot of energy into those specific properties and then we got a, we got a lot of uh, confidence from them uh in that they 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 liked the design of the show and the style and ended up partnering with them and so digital gives us our kit here um, and we work with them regularly, bouncing ideas back and forth and sending them the raw audio and, and frankly, some areas that we didn't have to deal with to, 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 at, a, at any level right. is, is getting on Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, yeah. Apple Pods. We focused on the content. We didn't focus, had to focus on that kind of nitty-gritty behind the scenes that kind of gets it out to folks, which is huge. I think that's necessary. Yeah. I think, too, what also made the podcast well is that we – prepare a lot for each guest as well both in like research and also com- and talking about it before we go on and trying to create a frame and that like we'll take this mass of google and then put it into notes and then put it into like a frame that you're able to kind of shape the conversation a little bit versus just kind of like going off the cuff each time yeah you do a great job of leading that research effort how do you approach it with each guest first i start hacking at google i don't think i've ever asked you that yeah actually. I, I, the first thing i do is i type in someone's name on google and get a very baseline um I guess we're going to this after Jeremy Lin once. Probably the best example is um, I started with Jeremy Lin there, and then I started doing Lin Sanity, and then I started looking at Lin Sanity deals, um, and I got down a rabbit hole of, like Weibo um, yeah. and trying to look at like Chinese social networks because mm. sometimes some things are not on Google. Some things people are, are lost in an article, like a nice little tidbit, um, and it's really just kind of going down a rabbit hole oftentimes and then finding a little stat or a number and trying to cross-reference that into things. Right. Um, but it's, it's fun. I mean, I think I enjoy – that's probably what I enjoy most, honestly, is, is producing that kind of frame for it. And then when you can see how that kind of translates into the actual interview is that oftentimes the guests kind of appreciate that you're not asking like, all right, well, what team are you on now or whatever. Like you have an understanding that you prepare for reading those notes and you oftentimes retype them. And in some cases, you've redone your notes yourself yeah. with like D. Smith and you see how that – took a whole different life of its own, that podcast, because you were there really energized, really educated about him as well. And so it's kind of yeah. huge. So what I'll typically do is I'll get Tyler's notes and I will then start with a blank sheet of paper myself. This is how I used to study for exams in college, actually. And I would take his notes and I would rewrite them. And then that would come naturally into the flow or that I had envisioned for that athlete or executive, uh, then I kind of create those specific topics broadly. Mm-hmm. And then what I like to do is go on Apple Podcasts into the search bar and search our guests and try and hear them on other pods because yeah. they'll often go off into areas of interest specifically. And what athletes are programmed to do, entertainers, celebrities, you name it, is to take a question Say, hey, that's a really great question, and then deliver what you know they're, they're what they've prepared, what yeah. they've prepared, or what they want to talk about, whether it's yeah. a book release, a film, or their latest game. Uh, there's a there's an art to that, and a lot of publicists start there in 101 with their new talent out of school. Uh, so the research is a big component of it. The biggest component. So we've talked about talent, we talked about partnership and research. The biggest component, though, as you launch a podcast is distribution. So we've thought a lot about like, okay, there are some fantastic shows out there that don't get distributed well, don't get listenership because it's just as challenging, just as competitive as being on YouTube, as being in television, as a pilot show. It's like you can have a terrific piece of art, you can have a terrific piece of audio, but if you don't have a strategy on acquiring new ears, it's going to die. Yeah. Um, so for us, we looked at, and you can probably add to this, we're going to bet that the content's good. So social media we have in-house, which is a, was a value prop for us. We wanted to cross-pollinate ourselves across other podcasts. So we wanted to get me and you on other shows to talk about suiting up. We wanted to find a strategic media partner, so someone that we could – Take our, our audio form, distill that down into like a six or seven hundred top three takeaway word, top three takeaway from my conversation with D. Smith or Venus Williams. Get that published on a platform with huge distribution. We found that recently with entrepreneur.com. So all of our kind of uh, musings on the podcast now live on entrepreneur.com. They push that out to their three and a half million followers on Twitter, which we hopefully will then acquire into new listeners on the podcast. Um, 
And then in any other any other pieces that I'm missing? Uh, it really covers it all. And we looked at, I mean, that's like we have now, but what we started out with so much more is that we looked at 20 plus pods and said, how are they getting their word out there? You know, because we felt like is, is the, if the product's great, it's great, but then no one's going to listen to it. How can we get the word out there? And that's kind of, we started backwards and then just looked at what other folks were doing and realized there's opportunity being lean and being that you have a good staff here as well to kind of get words out, get quote cards out and find a media partner as well. that can add that brand equity in that conversation too, that we did your LinkedIn profile as well. We've tried mine before um, and ended up kind of doing these like short, succinct, not really short, but 500 word kind of pieces following up each episode that adds color to the episode as well. It can make it live beyond it. Yeah. But I still don't think though that audio fits into our daily consumption habits in, in social like, I don't think that we're listening to audio, like, typically in 30-second spurts like we could be. Well, I think, like, you know, listen, when I promote a show on Twitter, people are on the Twitter platform to get quick news that's concise and fewer than 140 words. If they were on Twitter to find a link to a 45-minute dialogue between two people... It's just a small percentage of people that are doing But you can that. find stuff going on. I like oftentimes find Bill Simmons has a new podcast out with Kevin Durant. And I'll be like, awesome. Like, so I suppose you're following Bill Simmons, though, for long-form yeah. content, right? Most of my following is following me for, like, quick fitness, game right. updates. And yeah, so, for the cross. So yeah, yeah, so we're, we're, we're trying to actively uh, promote this evolution to my audiences across different platforms, yeah. but we're also trying to acquire new customers. Frankly, my Twitter platform had plateaued over the past two years. Uh, I had reached this, this probably this place where, you know, the, the platform overall is having trouble getting Gen Z's on, mm -hmm. right? And, and my biggest audience as a lacrosse influencer on YouTube and Instagram are Gen Z's. Um, and so I wasn't taking any significant steps uh, from, a, from a property standpoint into the broader sports business space, but I've acquired a, 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 a pretty decent amount of, of Twitter followers since launching the pod <laughs> because it's an interesting conversation that I think uh, appropriates well for Twitter power users. I agree. Yeah. Do you – is there anything you were surprised about since you've launched that and the reaction to it that folks have kind of said to you like – I'm really impressed with this. So I don't know you do all this business stuff. Like, have you gotten any like you know feedback from folks either you knew or from outsiders that you're totally shocked by? In well, some ways? I think that was your original thesis, right? You pushed me over the top in green lighting this project because, I mean, you were blunt. You were you were very. Uh, it, it was it was humbling. You were, you were very uh, you were very confident in saying like, "Hey, Paul, I I get exposed to this side of you that." Very, I think very few people, and not only our sport, but in broader sports business, yeah. don't know. And it's something that I think fits well with this medium. And it, that's an opportunity for all athletes who come on the podcast, too, is we're yeah. presenting a value prop that Justin Forsett can be known as this you know, startup founder. Like, right. if he didn't play football, you would describe him first as a founder you know, or a startup entrepreneur. Because he played football, it's like it's almost seemed like a side project of his, yeah. which I think is like misaligning because he's putting a lot of time and effort and energy into that. He should be considered both a, a former he NFL is. player and a founder entrepreneur. And mm -hmm. that, like, folks will oftentimes dismiss that as a one-liner in those kind of things you're saying. Venus the same way. is incredible. She's kind of managing two businesses. And yeah. so that's really, I think, what's lost is that you're doing this stuff on lacrosse, but your your day to day is a lot of business work and that you you get a lot of energy from that a lot more too, which I thought fascinating. Yeah. You you mentioned the word lost. It's it's really interesting that that is that it took us through the first seven episodes. We had a digital property. You you also mentioned my staff and Neil Savage yeah. has done a great job of creating studioutpodcast dot com. But through multiple conversations we've had with the folks at Entrepreneur, uh, their experience in the, in the audio space to folks at Digital as our partners and even our friends that are heavily embedded in podcasting were like, your guys' show notes suck. Yeah. <laughs> and we were like, yeah, well, we, we've definitely, we flagged improving our show notes and just the overall athlete episode webpage. But over the past two weeks, Neil has taken this thing on and I believe our digital presence right now can be just as much of a um, kind of a distribution boost that we're looking for in terms of really capturing 
the, the overall enormity of what we're trying to pull off. So you listen to audio right now or you listen to, say, our first five shows and, you're, and it's done. And maybe you were on my LinkedIn page and you saw uh, a Reflections article. Now you listen to the audio. You can catch the piece on entrepreneur.com, which we feel like is better because of the resources we get there. You can go on suitinguppodcast.com and look at each athlete. There are specific show notes. There's right now like 10 to 20 per athlete. So they carve out the time of they talked about a specific topic, right? Then underneath it, it's links. So Justin Forsett, you can go right to showerpill.com from our website and purchase one of his Mm -hmm. products. Um, When I was talking with Miles Chanley Watson, he referenced the YouTube video that set my channel on fire, and that was the Baltimore Harbor Toss. Neil throws the link to that on, right? Um, in my Angela Ruggiero interview, we talked about newsletters, and one of them was Scott Galloway's. Boom, there's a link to Scott yeah. Galloway's email newsletter, which I recommend to everyone. It's amazing, yeah. right? So we, we've got this uh, all-encompassing uh, digital presence now that I think – uh, does our our platform justice? I'm really excited about it. So now we're we're, we're pretty close. And it's been early on. I think if you look at your YouTube channel, it took a bit probably to figure out like the structure and styling. Whereas I feel like in the last month or so, we've really hit our stride in like what this podcast will look like, both from its concept and its content and the distribution as well. Yeah. So as we take a step forward now, ten episodes in, um, I mentioned. You know, us not necessarily taking a pivot traditionally as you hear it in, in business where you're like the product changes or you become a product company and now you're a services company or subscription-based platform, right? We're not, we're not going to change the style of programming here. But what we found starting with Coach Belichick uh, while, you know, in, in the sports space on the field, not an athlete, a coach, and then with D. Smith, which I think was our best podcast – thus far uh and then now talking to other sports business executives that i mean i would like to go after talent as wide as athletes to coaches to uh sports business executives to marketers to physical therapists to nutritionists anyone that 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 occupation impacts sports in a positive way whether it's an athlete or it's a revenue stream I, I like to sit down and have conversations with them. Yeah, I mean, I find a lot of the ones we currently do too kind of tail off into different elements of them. With Justin Forsett, his little music, you know, that he had done before, and right. and, and then he wrote a song for his wife, which is really cool. And uh, Matt Hasselback being the first NFL player on Twitter, um, you know, these little things here that we that don't necessarily tie into business, but are kind of key little intricates as well. So I think what we'd be interested in hearing from each of you is what your thoughts are on that, and. I know I've waited towards the end of each episode uh, through these first 10 to solicit feedback, but we are actively looking for it. I think that's what's great about modern media is that we have a show that's predicated on speaking to guests, and we've got 10 episodes in, and now the co-creators of the show are just sitting down and rapping about it. So it's very non-traditional. It's not what you see on network television. Uh, But we want to hear your feedback. We've we've gotten emails on folks that want to – and get involved and intern or work for Suiting Up Podcasts and here are certain skill sets that she and he brings. And, and so to, to reach out to us, you can email us at pod at suitinguppodcast.com. That's pod at suitinguppodcast.com. You can also tweet at me, and I have said this from the beginning, and to the extent that I've maintained it, I'm, prob- I'm Certain it hasn't been with 100% accuracy because you miss mentions from time to time. But if there's anything suiting up podcast related, I will be sure to respond to you. Yeah, you're I pretty good it. about that. Yeah, because yeah. this is like really important to me. It's an amazing I think too, show. I want to know what people found most interesting question wise from some folks as well. Like both of us obviously love the, the what apps in your home screen kind of question, but I'm interested to see like what kind of got Miles or Venus or Bill to speak that you want to hear more of that we might kind of waver. Cause we don't have a set structure. We're still trying to figure out what really works for us episode to episode. So very yeah. open to that. We had a short episode with Julie Foudy because of the constraints of being at ESPN, which I 
drove three and a half hours <laughs> yeah. that morning too the, and the found out. The hustle to do these interviews too is underrated. <laughs> I mean, like, to do the interviews you, is... <laughs> you flew overnight you know, to, to Foxborough, yeah. like, yeah. Uh, and then had an issue with your car, you know, the Uber out from Boston to Foxborough, remember? Right. Like, right. It's been a, it's been and a that lot. was during the trade deadline. So I was sitting in Gillette Stadium, fairly confident, remember texting you that I wasn't going to get to do this podcast with Coach because <laughs> they're in the middle of two trades. And he shut the door and did it for 45 minutes. It was really amazing. I was certain that one wasn't going to go on. But, yeah, let us know. Time of show is important. I know the D. Smith one's been our longest, but got a lot of good feedback from him. And then, surprisingly, you know, from, from my personal experience, I think you've shared this with me, some of my friends' favorite shows are, are you know, surprising to me. I kind of go around and say, hey, D. Smith, D. Smith. And some folks are like, Miles Chandler Watson was amazing. So yeah. people say, I love the Venus My mom Williams loves show. Miles Chandler Watson as well. Yeah. 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 So I think it's what's so unique about this platform is that, and audio and podcasting, and why we love it so much is that it all strikes us in such a unique way, unpredictable in, 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 to a certain extent. And there's one or two things that you take away where you're just like, wow, that. That was worth sitting in on. I want to know where people listen. Like, where do you listen to the podcast? Is it working out? Is it driving your car? Because to me, that's the most fascinating of the, you know, different uh, demographic sectors of, this, of the listenership. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, uh, I try not to, to look at our analytics and, and listenership and stuff. And, and I suppose, one, it's, it's probably just an area that I, that I stay away from generally in, in social because I want to focus on the actual product and less the results. And if I get caught more in results, I've been down that rabbit hole. Um, but also <laughs> what's really unique about podcasting is that I know from my own trends, different than, say, video uh, and YouTube specifically, is that it's longer form – and people pick and choose when listening to podcasts is right for them. And that may be someone's so busy, but they've flagged the Suiting Up podcast and they don't listen to it for two weeks or they may binge it. Right. It's just different. And with video, you're, really it's cool. out and you're, and you're watching it. It's two and a half to five minutes anyway. But let's, uh, let's wrap this by giving your favorite podcasts that you like to listen to. And I'll give mine. Uh, uh, because this space is communal. That's what we found. We're going to have a lot of overlapping ones. Um, I think Tim Ferriss is definitely number one for me. Yeah. Number uh, one. Yeah, without a yeah, doubt. so good. Uh, obviously, Kara Swisher. I also like Peter Kafka's as well for, for Recode. Recode. I'm a huge fan of. Kara Swisher's boys play lacrosse, and we have tweeted at her pretty often. Yeah. <laughs> Just to like, hey, you know, look at, look at us. Yeah. <laughs> if you search at Paul Rabel and Karen Fisher mentions, come up a lot. <laughs> Don't do yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but hey, it'll happen one day. Um, uh, or go up Peter. I think that'd be a great fit as well. Yeah. Um, so I think that uh, those two are definitely up there. I, I definitely like uh, Joe Rogan occasionally. I think it definitely varies what kind of mood I'm in. So if looking at like, a business Rogan's side, great. you know, Tim Ferriss is great. If looking for a laugh. Joe Rogan's really funny. Uh, part of my take is very funny as well from Barstool. Um, they both do a great job. Uh, and then I wonder, uh, I wonder if there's anything else that's kind of like not on your list we've discussed. Um, well, I think you, I know did, you mentioned Dan Savage. I listen to Dan Savage and Lovecast a lot. I think he's uh, not only a thought leader in the relational space, having spoken alongside Esther Perel, uh, who's licensed as a relationship therapist, personal therapist based in New York City, and she just did a deal with Audible, speaking about like really unique yeah. strategic partnerships, but she cross-pollinates across a lot of different pods and, and really strong kind of personal growth message. Uh, I listened to Malcolm Gladwell. His new season came out too, yeah, which is exciting. Which is uh, great. Uh, I was like, as soon as it came out, I listened to it immediately yeah. the one on golf. Yep. Planet Money is an OG show that, that's, that's really great. I actually, you know, I never listened to Serial, but I would say Serial and Planet Money are like the Two of the of like the real groundbreaking. Yeah, NPR podcasts. has had a few of them. Um, well, yeah, I was gonna say from from scratch is is a big kind of short founders story that NPR does. They just did Randy Hetrick, who I know well as the yeah, founder of TRX. That. that was really good. He was yeah. awesome. I kind of want to have him on our. It's show. It's funny listen 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 to the NPR show too with John Mackey, the CEO of Amazon. Uh, sorry, of Whole Foods. Yeah, because you know two weeks later they were acquired by Amazon, right? And he's like telling this like. Was he being cryptic? Uh, no, he gave us a very heartfelt origin story he obviously told it a bunch but it was like very endearing and then you read that they sell the company for 13 billion dollars yeah. you're like 
whoa, like it's yeah. kind of a cool behind the scenes look before it happened. Yeah, and again, shout out to Scott Galloway who predicted that. Yeah. I think Scott Galloway needs to have a longer podcast than he currently has. He's a new one out. I'm not sure if you saw that. Um, who? Scott Galloway does. Well, where he's, he's, in, he's like interviewing um, different folks in the luxury brand space. Oh, he's podcasting yes. now. Um, oh, I've always been waiting for it. Yeah. His so, YouTube channel or L2's YouTube channel is a company. It's fantastic. Founding. He's amazing. So From Scratch by NPR. Uh, I started podcasting um, – you know, much more off the back of Gimlet Media. Yeah, that was the one that 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 really triggered the idea that that this is something that I that I would like to do with a partner um, because of how transparent Alec Bloomberg was in startup. In startup, you know, season one was basically like this is how we're building a podcast, and so that was pretty cool. So it, w- worth mentioning Gimlet. So. Yeah, Tim Ferriss is, uh, is, has been an inspiration to both of us, and uh, I'd like to give him a shout-out. And, and each of you for listening to us um, since the beginning, or if you're new to the show, we encourage you to listen back to some of the other episodes. Uh, we'll plan on checking in once every so often to either uh, give more reflection on where the show is, where it's going, um, or uh, another idea that we have is is talking about kind of a recap and, and of of several guests at a time and some of our larger takeaways, uh, and then grabbing some of those audio bits and condensing it into something that we feel might be more functional, inspirational, or motivational. Uh, so we're going to try different things. Let us know what you think. Have guest suggestions. Have show suggestions. Email us pod at suitinguppodcast dot com. And um, next week's guest should be fun. Yeah, looking forward to it. It's been a fun ride so far. If you enjoyed Tyler and my conversation, be sure to let us know. Next week, I'm sitting down with Bloomberg Sports Business founder and strategist Scott Soshnick. Mark your calendars. He's one of the most well-engaged and knowledgeable people in all of sports. And continue the conversation with me on social media. By now, you should know my handles. It's at Paul Rabel. And be the first to listen to future episodes as well as catch up on previous shows, including my one-on-one conversation with the New England Patriots dynasty head coach Bill Belichick, world-class tennis star and entrepreneur Venus Williams, and NBA stud Jeremy Lin, just to name a few. You can find all of these episodes and more on Apple Podcasts, TuneIn, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your pods. There's a shortcut to our show notes, which I believe are some of the most extensive in the business. Shout out Neil Savage. Athlete lists, news and headlines by visiting suitinguppodcast.com. Talk to you all next week.